this talks about the landscape of vacua of string theory, and Mike laid out a founding vision for that field, and he's contributed to really most of the key technical developments over the years. Uh, I'm going to explain how we found incarnations of Mike's ideas, ensembles of flux vacua. So I first met Mike, as far as I recall, uh, at Les Uches in 2001. I was a first year graduate student, and I was a little bit worried that I wouldn't be admitted to the school. Um, but I went into Steve Schenker's office and asked him about it, and he said, don't worry, I'll write to my old buddy Mike Douglas, and he'll take care of it. And it got taken care of somehow. Um, this is a really formative experience for me. It was my first opportunity to meet most of the, Euro well, this portion of the European string theory community and, and, and others from further afield. Also, many of you here, um, some of the current organizers, in fact, were organizing then. Um, and during this meeting, I remember uh, Mike giving me an extremely patient one-on-one -on -one explanation of the derived category description of D-brains, which he was thinking about at the time, and was very far above my pay grade then as now, but I remember how kindly and carefully he explained it over really a long uh, period. So that made quite an impression on me. Now his lectures at this school were uh, outrageously ambitious because what he tried to do was to, as it says in the write-up, um, anticipate and lay the groundwork for the third superstring revolution. And, and what he said was uh, the third superstring revolution was likely to involve vacua and vacuum selection. He said many other things besides, but that was what I took away uh, from him. And so two years later, um, he wrote this paper, which again set out a vision for the field. Uh, if you can read that, it says, um, we initiate the study of ensembles of effective Lagrangians, the idea being uh, one should try to understand the statistics of vacua in string theory and learn how to make predictions from that. The next year with Frederick, um, he got a lot more specific uh, and gave results for the distribution and number of vacua in flux compactifications of type 2b string theory, which is the topic today. So in these studies of the landscape, there's a microscopic and a macroscopic approach. The microscopic approach is enumerative. One constructs individual solutions. And on the statistical side, one tries to study general properties or universal patterns. Now, my first encounter with Mike's work was on the statistical side. He led the way in both, but for me, uh, what I grabbed hold of was his counting of critical points, the paper I showed with Deneff. Um, and they had laid out this very beautiful set of statements about the characteristic distribution of critical points. In 2011, uh, with Marsh and Raza, I tried to understand how many of those critical points were in fact minima. We still did this statistically, not enumeratively. Um, we learned something that I thought was interesting. I won't be talking about it today. It's not related to today's subject. But we reached what I felt was an end of the road there. It didn't seem possible to me to go much further than Mike had gone. Maybe we added a little bit, but go further than there in the statistical approach without devolving into progressively epicyclic modeling of our own assumptions. Like the first few cuts were very clear and right. And then after that, one had to think for a long time or get new data, somehow revitalize the subject by having data that could be used to model, uh, to come up with statistical models. Um, so this is something that Mike himself had stressed to me uh, often when we spoke uh, in 2011, 2012, 2013 about those works. Um, essentially, he kept asking, well, how does this really work in real Calabiaos? Is this how it goes? And I didn't know the answer. Uh, we, we thought we ought to work on it. Now, the regime where uh, one was particularly lacking knowledge is the regime of a large number of moduli. So the statistical arguments that Mike and Frederick had made were arguments in a, a so-called continuous of flux approximation, mostly, where, where the flux uh, quanta uh, are essentially continuous, and related to that, and not identical to that, the number of moduli fields was some large number, an expansion parameter. So, for example, our results were matrix model results uh, at large n, and the n was the number of moduli. As you'll see partway through the talk, um, this presented a, a pretty big obstacle to enumerative work. I, I can already anticipate that now. If you're trying to solve uh, specific problems in cases where the moduli space dimension is large, your task is harder. Right. And so this was the, the trouble ahead of us. Uh, from 2014 onward, we built tools to study this case. And this talk is about one uh, set of solutions that resulted from those efforts. 
the larger program is constructing corners of the string landscape. So I'll just be showing you one corner. OK, so uh, just a little bit about the physics motivation, or one physics motivation for this line of work. Uh, as we all know, the cosmological constant problem is uh, a severe crisis. It has been for a very long time. The simplest explanation for the observed universe uh, is that the acceleration is caused by vacuum energy. And, and the problem is, why is the vacuum energy so small? Rather than thinking specifically in terms of high scale cutoffs, I find it useful um, to, to talk about it at least in terms of uh, the idea that theories of small fundamental objects characteristically produce small, dense universes. If you have a theory made of strings, then until you've done much else, you ought to expect the universes that result to be string size. This is, of course, the question of scale separation that Alessandro was telling us about. So we, we ought to ask, why is our universe exponentially larger than its constituents? Um, and this problem is far too hard. I have nothing to offer on this question. That's the real cosmological constant problem. But, but here's a question which is pretty close to it, on which I can offer something, which is how can one find such a universe? Namely, how can you take a theory of small constituents and exhibit an exponentially large universe? Okay, this is literally the problem Alessandro was talking about. How can we exhibit scale separation in solutions of string theory? Now, that won't necessarily explain why the universe in which we live has this property, but it's certainly a first step, I would say, an, a necessary first step to show that our theories at least have the capability of producing exponentially large universes. Now, the holy grail in this subject, perhaps you can't read it because of projection effects, is, is de Sitter solutions of string theory with small cosmological constant. And that's absolutely not uh, something that has been achieved, but there's been progress, and I'll be reporting on progress uh, in this direction. The progress is that we've found small negative cosmological constants in string theory. Um, we've found a class of a vacua of string theory in which the vacuum energy is less than, it could even be much less than, the observed value 10 to the minus 123 in Planck units. And yet, the internal space is modest in size. So these are universes in which the radius of curvature is larger than the radius of curvature of the de Sitter universe we inhabit. And they have hierarchical scale separation. We have examples in which the ADS length over the kaluza klein length is bigger than 10 to the 100. The vacuum energy is negative. OK, these are anti-de Sitter solutions. Uh, and so they don't describe our universe, but they do give a new angle or maybe a hope of a new angle on the cosmological constant problem. Uh, the mechanism is polynomial fine-tuning of topological parameters. And the purpose of this talk is to explain uh, the construction and how does one achieve polynomial fine-tuning of topological parameters in order to get exponentially small vacuum energy. I should say this is work, uh, I'll, I'll describe in a minute, but in case you can't read that, uh, this is work with Demirtas, Kim, Moritz, and Rios Tuscone in 2021. Okay, so um, let me give, let me not make you sort of guess throughout the talk what the main claim is going to be. Here's a summary of the main claim. We find solutions of type 2b string theory of the form ADS4 cross x6 with x6 a Calabi-Yau or antifold. The solutions preserve 40 n equals 1 supersymmetry. They have no moduli. The vacuum energy is exponentially small, in some cases uh, smaller than 10 to the minus 123. One doesn't have to be fixated on that number. We find plenty of solutions in which it's 10 to the minus 20, say. But this is possible. Um, and the mechanism is a racetrack, I'll explain what a racetrack is, uh, of world sheet instanton contributions in the mirror Calabio threefold. And as I will explain, modest integers, Gopakumar Vafa invariants and flux quanta, get mixed together in a way that exponentiates them. And that gives the vacuum energy. So as an example, these numbers are not made up numbers. I'll find 2, 252, and 58 uh, in an explicit example. And th their ratio, so 2 over 252 to the 58, is about 10 to the minus 122. So that's the kind of, of uh, equation at the heart of this. The work, of course, is to show that you can actually get these numbers in this arrangement in a solution of string theory. Right? In an EFT, this is a very easy thing to write down, but it's sort of an absurd thing to write down. Okay, so this allows us to find exponential hierarchies with polynomial effort, right? I only have to work polynomially hard to get these kinds of numbers, and then I get something like that. That's the game. 
Now, these models are certainly not realistic. First of all, I've already said that they have negative vacuum energy. Now, the Kaluza-Klein scale is high, very high, 10 to the minus 3 M Planck or something like that. No problem with that, but some moduli are ultralight. Uh, some of the moduli have masses 10 to the minus 33 electron volts, say. So it's just not realistic. Now, an uplift to De Sitter, which we're certainly thinking about, could in principle give vacuum energy plus 10 to the minus 123 M Planck to the fourth. And I claim even could give that in a way that's sort of believable and demonstrable. But, but uh, this would be with moduli and supersymmetry breaking scales that are ridiculously small. So that's not the real cosmological constant problem, which is to get small CC after supersymmetry breaking at scales at LHC level or above. And I'm not making any claim whatsoever about that. I want to be absolutely clear. Uh, what we're solving is more of a sort of supersymmetric CC problem which is to show how an exponentially large supersymmetric universe can arise in a theory with a small fundamental length scale. Okay. Any questions about the, the summary and goals? Okay, so these, these works changed at least our picture of how accessible such solutions might be in the string landscape. So uh, here are the people who did the work, Mehmet Demirtas, Manki Kim, Jakob Moritz, and Andres Rias Tascon. We're in the first paper on this. Uh, with me, and then we all together with Naomi Gendler and Richard Nelly are doing uh, a lot of follow-up work currently. Okay, so, so how do you find vacua? So a compactification of a string theory on a six-manifold that preserves 40 n equals 1 is characterized by a superpotential, which is a holomorphic function, and a Kähler potential, which is not, that depend on some moduli fields. And because the superpotential is protected by non-renormalization theorems and because it is holomorphic, it, it's effectively knowable. With enough work, one can really understand it. And the Kähler potential in the present era is not. It's poorly understood beyond one loop. And the scalar potential is determined by both. You need to know both. So what can you do? Well, the general strategy throughout this subject is find compactifications where you can compute the superpotential use the known superpotential and the leading order Keller potential to find vacua in a parameter regime where you can show a posteriori that it's consistent to neglect corrections to K, which you don't know. One can never by such means rule out um, conspiratorially large corrections to the Keller potential, but you can rule out uh, invalidation of such vacua from any reasonable kind of correction. Okay, so that's the game. You find a corner where the knowledge that you have might suffice. Um, so let's actually do that. Uh, we're going to think about type 2b string theory on an oriental fold of Calabia threefold. The moduli here are the axiodeleton, which is complex. Uh, H21 complex structure moduli ZA, and H11 Kähler moduli TI. So H21, H11 are the Hodge numbers of the threefold. And we're going to choose quantized three form fluxes, F3 and H3 and determine thereby a flux superpotential. The flux superpotential, after much work by many people, has been uh, sorted out. Well, the original shape of the flux superpotential was uh, written down by Gukov, Fafa, and Witten in 1999. The flux superpotential itself takes the form of an integral of the three-form flux wedge, the holomorphic 3-0 form of the Calabiao. And that can be written as a polynomial in the moduli fields plus a sum of exponentials in the moduli fields. So let's talk about general structures first. The non-perturbative terms in the superpotential come from D-brain instantons, uh, and these look like a sum of Fafian prefactors AI that depend on the moduli in general, times exponentials of the Kähler moduli. Okay, so this is the general structure. And in principle, um, if you had lots of examples where you knew all of these data, then you could just go to town and try and find minima and ask what properties do the minima have. Do you find interesting vacua? But that's too hard. It's really too hard now. What we do is simplify things. We find conditions under which we can prove that the polynomial part in the flux superpotential is zero. Exactly zero. So we're going to solve a Diophantine equation that guarantees that the polynomial terms in the flux superpotential are zero. We will furthermore uh, ensure that the sum of exponentials that follows is the sum of two terms that compete in a racetrack, I'll explain what that means, plus demonstrably negligible terms. And we will ensure that the prefactors here, which in general are functions of moduli, are not. 
We'll ensure that they're constant numbers instead. So these are three massive simplifications. And I want to stress, I'm not assuming that they happen. I'm going to show you that they happen. I'm going to find topological conditions that ensure that they occur. And when you do that, the whole superpotential is a lot simpler. Now the full superpotential for the whole system is a sum of two exponentials and a sum of a whole bunch of exponentials in the Kähler moduli, but with constant prefactors. And so the only moduli fields here are tau and the ti's, and there's just some numbers. So this is now a pretty well understood thing. And note that it only involves exponentials. Now the structure that we want to make use of is obvious. If the superpotential only has exponentials in it, then minimization of the scalar potential that results is going to be exponentially small. Okay, so that was the only task. But how are you going to make sure that you have a minimum rather than a runaway? Well, that depends on what the numbers are, right? And so we have to show that we can compute the numbers and find examples of those numbers, the various prefactors and exponents, such that the minimum doesn't occur at infinity, but occurs at some finite place with desirable properties. And so we'll do that. And with this structure, we're going to find that the VEV of the superpotential, so I'll periodically use this symbol, W0, it's just the expectation value of the superpotential, will show that it's exponentially small. So you should think about that as setting the scale of Susie breaking really low compared to the string scale, and that gives us lots of control. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. Now, how are we going to do it? Well, really we're inspired by, by this paper, Building a Better Racetrack, uh, that Mike wrote in 2004. Um, and so what is a racetrack? And why do we need to build a better one? And how can, what was the idea that, that we're drawing on from, from that work and related works of Mike? So to think about a racetrack, consider a four-dimensional n equals one field theory with a superpotential that comes from instantons. And let's say the theory just has one complex field z in it. And suppose the instanton superpotential is a sum of some decaying exponentials as written there. So here the n's are some real numbers and the p's are some positive numbers. Okay, so some decaying exponentials. And let's look along the real line, okay, along z, uh, real z. This thing decays as real z goes to infinity, right? Because I'm insisting that the prefactors p in the exponent are positive numbers. But you can easily convince yourself that um, if you just take this as a problem in single variable calculus, so minimizing this function along the real line, you find that you can do so. And the place where the minimum occurs, the, at the, the value z min, where the minimum is found, the expectation value of the superpotential is given by this function. Okay, it's some, some trivial exercise. But the thing I want to draw your attention to is that um, if p1 and p2, the two exponents, are much smaller, in, if their difference is much smaller than p2, and if the ratio here n2 over n1 is small, then you have a small number raised to a large power, and you have an exponentially small expectation value. That's the racetrack mechanism. Okay, this is an age-old idea. Um, all we're going to do is realize it in a string compactification, really do it. So what we need to show is that, okay, the flex superpotential is a sum of exponentials with these conditions that the exponents are quite close to each other and the prefactors are a little bit hierarchical. Okay, so now comes the, the one fairly heavy slide where we do all the work of setup. Um, so let's, let's set our notation. We're going to write down a symplectic basis of h3, that's where we're putting the fluxes, and then we can define the periods as the integrals of the 3, 0 form over such a basis. Uh, the periods contain information of uh, coordinates on the moduli space and the derivative of the prepotential with respect to the coordinates. And the prepotential on general grounds takes the form of sum of polynomial terms and a sum of instantons. The the, um, and I'll tell you about those pieces in turn. So the key technical advance, the thing that allowed us to do the work we have done, is being able to compute the prepotential via mirror symmetry. A and if you followed mirror symmetry, you may say, wait a minute, this, this is something that was done in the very early 90s. This is what mirror symmetry is for as a practical matter. Its job is to compute prepotentials for you. Our contribution is just doing this in threefolds with many moduli. If you think back to the beginning, I was saying one often needs to work in cases where the number of moduli is large. The uh, heroic works of the early 90s worked with number of moduli one and two. Okay, and one hasn't gone very far beyond that since. So we'll go up to uh, very large numbers. The computation is purely geometric. The essential idea is one has to compute the so-called fundamental period. So here, um, 
sigma 3, 0 is a distinguished 3 cycle in a Calabi-A 3 fold. Why is there a distinguished one? Because these 3 folds will be hypersurfaces in toric varieties, and in toric varieties there's a distinguished torus. So I can make a distinguished 3 cycle. If I integrate the 3, 0 form over a distinguished 3 cycle, then by some relatively well-known techniques, you can extract all the periods. The periods are, after all, just the integrals of omega over various other cycles. Now, that's all well and good, but that gives you the periods in a real basis, and one needs them in an integral symplectic basis. And for that, that's the only place where we really use mirror symmetry. We use the known integral structure of the mirror threefold, the fact that we know the intersection numbers on the mirror side. And this is what we get. So the polynomial part, um, we don't need to pay much attention to it in detail. It's just a cubic polynomial plus dot, 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 um, where the z's are the complex structure moduli. And all the stuff in different colors are topological data of different kinds of the mirror. Intersection numbers of the mirror, Turing classes of the mirror, Euler number of the mirror. Okay, but the instanton terms are going to matter. So let's look at these for a minute. The instanton sum is a sum over curve classes in the Mori cone of the mirror. So these are uh, these are two cycles in the mirror, effective two cycles in the mirror, and it's a sum over such two cycles of a number, n sub q tilde, that's the genus zero Gopukumar Vafa invariant of the mirror, times a trilogarithm of an exponential of the moduli. Okay, so this, this is slightly complicated. Uh, let me remind you, uh, if you haven't thought about these things much or much recently, that the sum over all curve classes of a GV invariant times a trilogarithm of this exponential is the sum over all classes of the gromov witten invariant times just the exponential. So the Gopukumar-Vafa invariants and the gromov witten invariants are just related by a resummation that turns exponentials into trilogs of exponentials. The GV invariants are the nicer packaging for our purposes. There's some integers, um, they're BPS indices, they're, they're good objects to work with. And they'll drive most of this computation. Okay, um, and so how do you go forward uh, to a flex superpotential? Well, the flex superpotential is the integral of g wedge omega. This is g. But if you know the integrals of omega in a basis, and you know the integrals of g, well, f and h in a basis, then you can write this pairing in terms of just an appropriate symplectic dot product of the flux integers and the period vectors. Okay? The, the pi vector is the integrals of omega over a basis. The f and h are the integrals of the flexes over a basis, and sigma is a symplectic matrix that pairs them together. This is how the superpotential is related to the data of quantized flexes and periods. Okay, so what's our work going to be? We're going to pick flexes, compute periods, pair them up, and see what we get. Now the structure we want to exploit in here is that the flux superpotential can be expressed as a sum of perturbative and instantonic terms where by perturbative flex superpotential, I mean the stuff that comes from f poly, and by instantonic part of the flex superpotential, I mean the stuff that comes from f inst. In type 2b string theory, nothing on this slide is quantum mechanical. It's all classical. But viewed from the mirror, these ones, these instantonic ones, in type 2a on the mirror, these terms are quantum effects, world sheet instanton effects. So that's why I'll keep calling them instantonic, but remember, it's just an expansion of a classical result. Okay, so what's our game? Uh, our game is going to be to find fluxes such that the perturbative part of the superpotential is identically zero along one complex direction in the moduli space. We call that a perturbatively flat vacuum. So we're going to try to find perturbatively flat vacuum. Choose fluxes to get flat vacua. And then, having done so, we're going to find subcases where the remaining instanton terms, so all that will remain will be instantons, we're going to make sure that the instantons that remain form a racetrack. So let's see how that happens. I'll, give, I'll just give you an example. Okay. So here's an example where the number of complex structure moduli is 5, the number of Keller moduli is 113. This is what I meant by large numbers, not the 5, but the 113. Um, and we find quantized fluxes, here they are. So nice, reasonable integer numbers of fluxes, such that, um, along, oh, so I said along a particular direction in the moduli space, along a direction where the complex structure moduli vector is proportional to the axiodiliton by this rational vector. Okay, so that's just one relationship, one linear relationship in the six dimensional joint moduli space of the five complex structure moduli and the axiodiliton. 
along that direction, the perturbative part of the flux superpotential vanishes exactly. One can check that. This is what I'll call the perturbatively flat direction. So along that direction, it vanishes. Because we're working along one particular direction, I can use tau as my coordinate. So you shouldn't see any z's anymore. Everything can be expressed in terms of tau. It's a one-dimensional problem, which is nice. So what remain along that direction are two-way world sheet instantons. And the leading ones, it turns out, you do the calculation, have GV invariance minus 2 and 252. So uh, the flux superpotential takes the form minus 2 this exponential plus 252 that exponential plus a subleading term. I write this one not because we need it, the black one, but because it's the next thing in line and it's much, much more, uh, much, much smaller than the ones in red when uh, one is at weak string coupling. So what's with the 729ths and 728ths? That looks like an absurdly close ratio. Well, that's what we engineered. That's why I chose these numbers here. I chose these such that the exponents here would come out quite close. And they did. When you solve with this flux superpotential, you find that the modular stabilized at g string equals 0 0.01. And w naught, the VEV of the superpotential, is 2 over 252 to the 29, which is 10 to the minus 62. OK, so very small. Are you dealing with n equal 1 or n equal 2 supersymmetry? Very good. Dealing with n equals 1. And what we're, what we're living off of here is that the, um, the... You're wondering why did I talk about a prepotential or what exactly? And I just think of putting 2b on a Calabiot threefold that I think gives n equal 2, doesn't it? It absolutely does. Yeah, so this is an orientifold of a Calabiot threefold. Yeah, yeah, right. So the orient, so we're going to have an O3, O7 orientifold. I won't show you exactly where the O3s and O7s are, but that they're somewhere specific. And what I'll have to do is argue that, um, well, what we'll have to examine is when we start studying the Kähler potential, um, how big are the n equals 2 to n equals 1 breaking effects, and how much uncertainty do they inject into our knowledge of the Kähler potential. So that's quite critical. It turns out that the O-planes um, can be arranged in a good way. But yeah, that's, that's a serious, uh, serious issue. Yeah, yeah I mean, your, your point is well taken. All this geometric stuff is n equals 2 stuff, but um, we're ultimately talking about an n equals 1 superpotential um, and, and killer potential. Yeah. Great. OK, other questions? Yes. Uh, will uh, your orientifolds, they are localized here, or they are? Uh, they're real orientifolds. They're honest to God orient. They're on, you know. The, the involution of the first toric coordinate goes to minus itself or something like that. We know exactly where they are, um, and we can, you know, we can check their intersection numbers with other things. It controls still the, oh, the back reaction. Absolutely, yeah. Well, the nice thing is all of my orientifold, all of my um, 07 planes will come in SO8 stacks, 4D7 is 107, and so the back reaction is exceedingly mild there. There's just a minus one in SL2Z monodromy around them, but there's no net charge. The net seven brain charge is locally canceled. And so, so life is actually very good. They're precisely localized. Yeah, had we had general seven brain configurations, one would have to work actually quite hard to argue that there aren't substantial corrections. Yeah. Which one is a small parameter? Yeah, here, uh, it's, it's that, so if you, if you, look at the terms in red and try to find a minimum. You find the minimum occurs at g string is 0.01. And then so tau, m tau ha is, is 100. Uh, and, or, or tau, rather tau, m tau is i times, m tau is 100. 100 so that you get an e to the minus 2 pi times 100. Okay. For, and that's why this suppression, since this is a larger suppression than 7 28ths, it, it's profoundly suppressed. Now, if, if we only knew it was plus dot, 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 and I couldn't compute the, the next terms, then you might wonder, well, what if the next thing is awfully close and has a rapidly growing coefficient or something? And I'll show you stuff about that later for the killer potential where one had to check that. Here, we can just compute as many terms as you want, and, and it's clearly very exponentially controlled. Other questions, comments? OK, so, so this is good. Um, so in this example, with Hodge numbers 513, um, the numbers that show up are, I'll call those 729ths and 728ths, right? That's the racetrack that shows up. We find some other examples in the paper, like three, 34 over 280 and 35 over 280, and stuff like that. Or my favorite, 32 over 110 and 33 over 110. Um, and we worked these out and tested in full detail in the paper as complete examples. You can look at every piece of them. We give the data in the archive posting, et cetera. 
And now we can easily generate vast numbers of other things like this. We can generate them roughly a million per core hour now, if we want. But we saw no reason to write them up. Um, so they're just piling up in our hard drives. Um, so we, we just brought out five that we thought were very nice. Here's the example. But you know, if you want more, we can make you lots more. Um, OK, so the story so far, there's a general form of the superpotential. Um, and we chose fluxes such that the polynomial term in the flux superpotential vanishes. That's the perturbatively flat condition. So that's a choice of fluxes. We then, having done that, made sure that the Calabi-Yau that we had chosen had nice GV invariants such that the remaining terms in the flux superpotential made a nice racetrack. And then that brings the superpotential to the form of a racetrack for tau plus an ex sum of exponentials in the Kähler moduli. So what about the Kähler moduli? Well, um, we still need to ensure that there are at least h11 of these. So if there's h11 Kähler moduli, there better be at least h11 terms in this sum. So at least h11 of the Fafians better not be 0. We're going to do something stronger, uh, just to be even safer. We're going to make sure that at least h11 of them are non-zero and they're numbers. They're not functions of moduli, so they can't vanish anywhere in the moduli space. They're just non-zero numbers. Um, I won't bore you with that. If anyone's curious, I'd love to talk about it afterward. That was a whole piece of work, being able to check that, but we checked it. Yes, Alessandro. Uh, sorry, there's something I didn't quite catch. Um, how were you able to handle all those moduli? Are you just better with computers than people that came, uh, who came before you? I mean, what was the... The 113? I'm not better with computers than anybody, but I have some students who are. Yeah, um, I, I will explain. That's actually, uh, that's the part we're almost coming to. So I, yeah, that, that's, that's a... Um, the idea behind the... There's a collection of ideas behind it. As you'll see, it's a combination. I won't maybe explain it in enough detail here to... to well, well, but, but let, me, let me address that point of um, was there an idea. Roughly speaking, the idea was that general purpose computational geometry software does not fully exploit the structure in toric varieties. And if you know the structure in toric varieties and you design specialized computational geometry software that does exploit it, then you can turn problems that were exponentially costly in general purpose to polynomially costly. And that's what we did. It required some people who are very good with computers, but, but fundamentally what was required was um, a structure to exploit rather than just you know, slightly more efficient code. Uh, and that'll become clear when I, when, I, when I go through this in a minute. So indeed, it's a question of manufacturing. So what do, we actually, what do you have to do? Begin with an oriental fold of a Calabi-Yau. Compute the topology of uh, the divisors. Make sure there's enough of them that have uh, what do you call pure rigid, that have constant non-zero Fafians. Um, if this test fails, reject. Find another Calabi-Yau. There's lots. Um, if it passes, compute the prepotential via mirror symmetry. That's what I've explained. And find quantized fluxes that align with the GV invariance of the mirror to give a racetrack without going past the consistency condition set by the tadpole. And step four, finding the fluxes, is a search in a lattice. It's a search in z to the twice h21. So in the example I gave where h21 was five, that's a search in a 10-dimensional integer lattice. And that's actually not ridiculously easy. Um, a brute force search is feasible up to maybe five or six on a laptop, and maybe seven to 10 on a cluster. One can do better eventually, but um, this will be enough for now. So, so what's the setting? So we're going to work with mirror pairs of hypersurfaces, x and x tilde, in toric varieties v and v tilde, obtained from triangulations of four-dimensional polytopes, delta circ and delta. And um, there's 473,800,776 four-dimensional reflexive polytopes, as found by Kreutzer and Skarka in 2000. Uh, here I've just shown the 16 two-dimensional reflexive polytopes. And then if you go about triangulating these things, we proved uh, in, in 2020 that there could be at most 10 to the 428 Calabia threefolds resulting from the list. But, but that'll be enough. Um, so what we did is write a software package. This is with my students, Mehmet Demirtis and Andres Rios Tuskon, who did all of the writing uh, of the code. Um, a software package for analyzing Calabia manifolds. We call it CY Tools. Um, and it's designed to go beyond what pencil and paper constructions and, and other software uh, has gotten stuck at. Uh, it's purpose built to analyze triangulations and the associated Calabia manifolds, especially in the previously unexplored regime where the number of moduli is large. And this has allowed us to access the, the whole range uh, of threefolds in the Kreutzer-Skarka list. So we had a long series of works building up to this, but eventually 
uh, bore fruit. So here's the famous plot of uh, Hodge numbers of Calabia threefolds from the kreutzer skarken list. And the complexity of analyzing, let's say, x, the one with, for which this is h11, grows exponentially as you go this way, and the complexity of analyzing its mirror grows exponentially as you go up this way. And by grows exponentially, I want to stress that if you work with like Sage or Macaulay 2 or something like that, most of the stuff you can do stops when any of the Hodge numbers is like 4 or maybe 10 if you really push it and specialize it. Okay, but these numbers go up to 491 on both axes. So with off-the-shelf stuff, one can work in these very faintly visible shaded bands, um, but we had to really, you know, handle the whole space, learn how to compute GV invariance for the whole list. Uh, and the like, and, and, and we can do that. So um, where the search for flux vacuum is feasible, which is when H21 is not that big, so the lattice you're searching is not very high dimension, um, H11 is typically large, like 100 or something. So we have to do basically everything at large H11, the oriental folding, finding rigid divisors, uplifting to F-theory, computing GV invariance, all that stuff, but, but with CY tools we can do that. Um, and so we did it. We searched for vacua. So, so far we've shown that superpotential takes this form, an exponentially small constant plus a sum of non-zero constants times exponentials. The ci are some dual coxeter numbers. And this is the leading order Keller potential. It's a function, uh, it's, it's a log of the volume as a function of the Keller moduli. Now, we want to solve the f-flatness condition. We're trying to find supersymmetric vacua. Um, and it's, it's easy enough to write down what that condition looks like at leading order uh, in our expansion but you actually have to solve it. And so where, where in the Keller cone is the solution, or is there a solution? This actually also required some, some cleverness with, with programming, um, because here's a picture, not that clearly rendered yet, it's coming in. Um, each polygon in here is a different phase, so a different uh, triangulation of a polytope corresponding to a different Calabiao. And um, you can think of these as different chambers of the extended Keller cone. And we might start, for example, here, and the vacuum might lie there. And you're certainly not going to find it by checking through all of the exponentially many different chambers, but um, my student thought of a clever way of uh, sort of taking a bearing to the right point and just marching through the space until you get to the, the solution. So this is, again, exploiting structures inherent in the problem rather than just sampling faster or something like that. Okay, and you get to a vacuum, and here it is. Here, here, here's the vacuum um, for the same example. So in the example where I showed you the fluxes and super potential before, this is a, there's a lot of stuff on this slide, but let me just show, let me point to the parts that are important. This slide contains all the information one needs to analyze uh, the vacuum. Here's the polytope. Each of the columns is a vector in z to the fourth, so that defines some lattice polytope. Triangulate it. Choose fluxes like this. You get this superpotential, this uh, w naught, which I've described before, and when you go ahead and solve, you find that the supersymmetric ADS4 vacuum that results has volume 945 in string units, so not that small, not that big, and the vacuum energy is 10 to the minus 144 m Planck to the fourth. And this number, you know, 2 over 252 to the 29th or to the 58th is what's coming in here. Okay. And the volumes are decent. The Einstein frame volumes of things are, are reasonably sized. The volume of the threefold in, in uh, Einstein frame is 10 to the 5. So no problem. All right. And um, maybe a, a useful way of, of remembering at least how, how we think about this is you can put all the data you need to specify the solution on a t-shirt, right? You just say, this is the polytope I want. This is a triangle that specifies the data of a triangulation. These are the fluxes I want. That's enough. It's fully determined. Um, these, these data already given determine for you the GV invariance along a flat direction, and from that you can compute the scalar potential, and you can see what things look like. So that's sort of fun. Um, now we can ask, and, and what I'll ask, how much time do I have? Uh, five, maybe five big minutes. Five big minutes, okay. Okay, great. Eight What's that? Eight minutes. Eight minutes. Okay, great. So um, let's talk about control here. So the control of the superpotential uh, is, is actually really good. As I promised at the beginning, it's holomorphic. It's determined by topological data. Not that hard. Um, we've ensured that the prefactors here are non-zero numbers. Um, we can't compute those numbers. Alexandrov, Sen, Stefanski, 
Ferrat and Kim are working on it, but, um, and, and maybe they'll, they'll succeed in, in the near future, but what we showed is that our vacua persist unless these numbers are absurdly small or large. So I think that's okay. Um, we, sure, we ensured that other instanton contributions to the superpotential, Euclidean D3 brains or Euclidean D minus one brains, uh, are negligible. But now let's talk for the remainder about the part that's a little bit more interesting, a little bit harder. How do we control the Kähler potential? So the Einstein frame volumes are large, but the string frame volumes are not that large. They're actually order unity. And the reason is that the, um, the large parameter making Einstein frame volumes big was one over log of W naught in, is, is log of W naught inverse. It's the same thing that makes G strings small. So when you multiply them, unfortunately the parametric stuff cancels and you get volumes of order one or two pi or something. Now, the saving grace here is that at weak string coupling, all the effects, this comes back to John's question about n equals two, all the breaking effects from n equals two to n equals one come from brains, O-planes, and flexes. And those things are all suppressed by factors of G-string. So when G-strings tend to the minus two, to very good approximation, the Keller potential that one cares about is determined purely by curvature corrections that can be computed in the n equals two theory. Um, and so the Kähler potential to excellent approximation is given by this kind of expression that you can read off from the mirror. It's intersection numbers, a constant correction, and then some horrible sum of trilogs and dialogs with GV invariant prefactors. But the point is one in principle knows what the whole sum is if you can compute the GV invariance. But now we're not computing the GV invariance of um, something that was, let's say, had five complex structure modules, of, of a five dimensional moduli space we're computing the GV invariance of a, let's say, 113 dimensional moduli space. So now we have to do the GV calculation on the big side, which is where it's much harder. So, and this is related to the, the, the only remaining physics point I, I wanna talk about um, before sort of a protracted summary is the convergence of the world sheet instanton sum. So let me define this quantity Cn. So n's a counting number, and this is a prefactor. This is the GV invariant for n times some curve class Q. The Q some curve class we're interested in, and this is the magnitude of the nth term in the world sheet instanton sum. So T is a vector of Keller parameters. Q dot T tells you how suppressed that thing is, and this is asking if I know about an instanton wrapping a curve once, how worried should I be about wrapping it twice, etc. At big enough volume, not very worried, but it depends on how fast the prefactors grow as n grows. So that's what we better figure out. So the series converges if Cn goes to zero as n goes to infinity. And so we just compute the GV invariance for small curves and we check. For the curves that are big, you're just safe. It's automatically easy. But how about all the small curves? There are some small curves. So we just did it. Uh, and there's two kinds of curves. We'll call them nilpotent and potent. The nilpotent ones are the ones where the GV invariant becomes zero after a finite number of terms in the series. And the potent ones are the ones that come in infinite series. Nilpotent curves actually are safely collapsible. When you collapse them to zero size, they give finitely many polylogs, and we include those explicitly in all our calculations. They are incorporated. The potent ones are different. The potent ones, in principle, keep giving more and more complicated terms. So we kept searching until we found, okay, we got, we got bored at the point at which we'd found 1728 rays of potent curves. And so we looked along those rays and asked, this is for one of our five examples, okay. And we asked, you know, how bad are things? Does the series converge? So, so let's think about uh, this for a minute. So along multiples of one particular curve, the GV invariants look something like this. So here's one example. So they're growing. And then we computed it at 100C and you get something like this. So this is certainly the first computation of <laughs> GV invariants of this kind of degree uh, in this kind of dimension. Um, and we can, just, we can just go on and on if you want. Um, and it'd be fun to find some, some structures to, to learn about in there. But um, what you can see, well, you can't see it from this, but if you take logs and plot it in Mathematica or something, you'll see it's an exponential increase with a very stable rate. That's why we wanted to do the computation out that far. But what is the rate? So if, if uh, t is large enough, if the curves are big enough, then the decay here will dominate the growth there. Right? This is, if this is exponentially growing with n, and this is exponentially decaying with n, which it obviously is because there's the n, um, then the decay will win. The question is, where is this going to happen? Well, so there's some encouraging work from, from long ago from the, the classic paper, Candelas de Lassa, uh, Green and Parks for, uh, on, on the Quintic, where um, if you just worked with the first term in the series, the famous 2875, where the GV invariant is 2875, and use that to try to estimate the radius of convergence, you find the radius of convergence is T is 1.27. And then when they did the exact calculation, it was actually 1.2. 
So not a very big change from taking the leading term. Okay, and so here we're not taking just the leading term, we're taking uh, a stupid number of terms. And so the question is just, in our vacua, is t large enough or not? Are we inside the radius of convergence or not? And so here's, here's the result. What I'm plotting here is log of xn versus n. And you note that they're all lines. This is a log plot. Since they're lines, that means they're exponentially decaying. And they're all lines that are angled downward. And this is a histogram of, of the lines, with the, of the slope, really. And what it's showing you is that it's not like we failed to detect a huge population here. We think we'd really caught all of them and there just aren't any um, that have positive slope. So since all the lines have negative slope, that means every curve that we could find was either safe automatically or um, it corresponded to a convergent series expansion that we can compute and incorporate. And so this is why I claim we understand uh, corrections to, to the Keller potential. Um, these are only the curvature corrections. There are other corrections, but those when the other ones are suppressed by explicit factors of g string, which is 10 to the minus 2 in this case. And so I really think these are under extremely good control. We calculated everything in the system except for um, the Fafian prefactors, which we only showed are non-zero. Okay, the largest correction that we were able to find is of order 10 to the minus 5. Okay, so um, let me comment on why this was feasible, um, and then, and this comes back to some relationships to Mike's work, um, and, then, and then close. So the general expectation is that finding small vacuum energy should cost you a compute time or an effort or something one over that number, the vacuum energy. So like in an n-dimensional buso polchinski flux landscape, there are vacua generally with vacuum energy 10 to the minus n, but you expect to have to search through 10 to the n things to find them. They're rare, and, and you have to search one over the rarity to get one. Right? So this is sort of a general and reasonable expectation. So, but we have, in the example I keep showing you, um, of order 5 and of order 100. Like I showed you 5, 113. And the flux landscape is low dimensional. You know, it's a 10 dimensional flux lattice. So what's going on? How can we um, succeed at all in finding like 10 to the minus 123 or something in a 10 dimensional lattice? That shouldn't have been possible. It's, you know, it's certainly not a 10 to the minus lattice dimension effect, so, so what's going on? Well, we're doing things differently, right? In, the, in a busel polchinski type picture, what one is doing is, is fine-tuning a vast number of order one terms to high precision. So you imagine, so here, Q is a vector of, say, flux integers, and Cij is some quadratic form. And what you imagine doing is fine-tuning the value of that quadratic form, pairing integer vectors together here, against some given constant negative thing. And if you take this quadratic form to have you know, some m plank to the fourth value, but very precisely tuned to almost exactly cancel this, you can get some exponentially small thing, but that will cost you. That will be hard to do. In our construction, we're not doing that. Rather, we're striking out all the perturbative contributions from the beginning. And so and this step is exact because of the explicit choice of flux quanta. And so all we're really doing is balancing exponentially small terms against each other, not balancing a whole lot of terms against some order one term. And that's why it's exponentially easier uh, this way. Now, it's certainly not the case that all vacuo with small vacuum energy in the 2B flux landscape are our kind. Um, in fact, ours are a rare subset, but they're uh, a numerous enough subset that they exist, they can be found, uh, and the more general ones that are exponentially hard to find, um, we, we shall see uh, when people manage to find them. Um, so uh, now, I keep saying that um, the effort involved is polynomial, but coming back to Alessandro's question, some computational advances were required in order to enumerate the integers in the first place, right? In order to be able to do uh, the, the manipulations of, of integers. And so we had to be able to construct orientifolds, compute GV invariants and Kähler cones, uplift to F theory, enumerate floppable curves, all these things at very uh, large Hodge numbers, and then choose quantized fluxes giving small W. Now, that was a Diophantine problem that, that we had to solve, uh, and we had to do so automatically on a very large scale. But um, you know, our software is sufficient uh, for the task, and so we're able to do it. And then having done that with those data in hand, we can then work polynomially hard and, and find exponentially small CC. So the final answer is, you know, think back to the um, putting all the data on, on one slide, on a t-shirt or something. They're expressed in terms of integers, and you can verify an awful lot of it by hand. So uh, in conclusion, we've given explicit constructions of supersymmetric ADS4 vacua in Compactifications of type 2b string theory on Calabi-Yau threefold orientifolds. 
the stabilization is that weak string coupling, large complex structure, large Einstein frame volume. These are very heavily tested. Uh, we judge them to be quite robust. And they're incarnations of the KKLT scenario, although with some special structures. And uh, our claim then is that supersymmetric KKLT vacua are part of the string landscape. The mechanism we used for a small W-naught led to exponentially small values of the vacuum energy. Because the search is automated, large-scale studies are possible. We're engaged in some. More results will come out. Uh, the uplift to desitter space is very much uh, a question for the future. Happy birthday, Mike. So, any questions after this beautiful talk for Costas? Yeah, that's very impressive, Liam. But uh, I have a very simple question. Can you show us the loophole in the swampland uh, arguments that would argue against this? And let me make it more precise. Are you sure? I mean, you have a very nice control of the vacuum, but what about the spectrum? Could you have very light stuff popping up, towers, you know, which show to you that uh, there's some hidden KK scale that uh, is very large. Yeah, very you, you, you mentioned extremely light um, yes. excitations, but then you didn't but come back to the, right. the, the Yes, the, 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 the light, you know, the low scale of supersymmetry breaking, etc. Though, yeah, those things don't come in there. So there are fields that 10 to the minus 33 electron volts or something. So that makes it phenomenologically pointless, but it, it doesn't render it inconsistent. The Kaluza Klein scale is a is little bit below the Planck scale. Now, let, let me respond to, to your question by, um, by saying, I think we should have a discussion afterward about general swampland arguments, unless you want to give us, if you want to relate a specific one. To the best of my knowledge, the claims that would say such things can't happen are of the form, with simple ingredients, it doesn't happen. In asymptotic regimes, it doesn't happen. Therefore, it will never happen. And we didn't work exactly in asymptotic regimes. We certainly did not only use simple ingredients. And so I claim it did happen. Now, but then a, a variant of your question is setting aside whether anyone might have written a paper claiming this shouldn't have worked. You could ask me, what am I most worried about in this construction? Right? And, and there I have a very clear answer. I'm most worried about um, corrections to the Kähler potential from n equals 2 to n equals 1 breaking effects. Right? So um, though these descending lines I showed you were the n equals 2 curvature corrections to what becomes the Kähler potential. Very nice. Those are safe. But what about the effects from localized brains? Well, those are controlled by factors of the string coupling. But if I try to find vacua, for example, where g-string is, is a quarter or something like that, you know, I, I really don't know. And you might worry that the three-loop correction to the Kähler potential has an anomalously large coefficient and destabilizes some of these things. That's the level of worry we have to, we have to get to. It's only in that case that I can see that, that these vacua could be invalidated. But you don't worry about some cycle becoming extremely small and generating, you know, towers of light stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, we, we, worried, we worried very much. So, um... What kinds of towers would they generate? You know, where would we see that? Well, we would see it in, in here. They would be, you would see an instanton series would come down and you get killed by it. And so what we had to do upon finding, you know, I showed you that multicolored plot where you see a point in the Kähler moduli space. Once you get to a point in the Kähler moduli space, you know the VEVs of the Ts. You then have to take this formula, knowing the GV invariance, and ask, at that point in moduli space, am I killed by an instanton series that has come down or not? If we didn't have the ability to compute the GV invariance on the hard side where the dimension is large, we would have had to say, eh, probably killed, in fact. I, I mean, I was 50-50 before we did it, really. I, I had no idea whether we could possibly be safe in that regime. But then we just checked, and it turned out that we were, in fact, inside the radius of convergence. Um, for those series. And so now it can't be, we show, I mean, look, g-string is really small, so you're not killed by like PQ strings or some worse stuff. The world sheet instantons are the worst thing. The only thing we can be killed by, I claim, is not an instanton at all. It's, it's a loop correction to the Kähler potential with anomalously large effect. Uh, do, you, do you know that the diameter of the manifold isn't getting big? I mean, does that literally follow from? Yeah, the diameter of the manifold 
let, let me show you the sizes here. So the, the volume is not, the volume is decent, but there's a sixth power in there. So the diameter is not very big. The volume is, is, is 10 to the sixth. You're assuming it's not anisotropic in some way if you make that simple mm -hmm. relation. Let's see. Um, wait, where, where am I assuming isotropy? The, the, the VEVA, the T's? Well, it, the uh, sixth root of the volume is a lower bound than the diameter. And if it's anisotropic, of course, the Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, sure, yeah. No, I'm not saying I know the diameter, but um, do you, are you, you're, you're worried? A strong reason to think it, but uh, it is a possible loophole. In which term in the effective action would you expect to see um, an action? Giving a KK tower, you know, it's not yeah. something that shows up directly in, yeah. the, in what you yeah. described. I mean, uh, yeah. Right, so, I mean, these, this space is anisotropic in the following simple sense. Um, some of the curves are very small, such that it's not the case that the, is, might not, is, isn't completely satisfactory to say, well, look, we found one kind of anisotropy, maybe that's the only one that's present. But we did find one kind of anisotropy here, which is that the, the volume is not, just, um, is, is not just the case that the four cycle volumes to the three halves power give the total volume. Everything, all the little bits are small, and the total space is decent in size. Um, you know, the curves are relatively small. If you look at the, uh, just the polytope, is it kind of anisotropic or isotropic? What is just naively, you know, looking at the polytope? There's a, there's a pretty decent polytope. The things that are unusual about the polytopes that give good vacua um, are only that they have a sizable tadpole. So... Right, but I mean, I mean, the polytope does have a shape, right? Yeah, it, this one, uh, we've never, we certainly tried very hard um, but not very systematically yeah, to, to some, learn. Some, some kind of, uh, you know, something one can say about the diameter just from simple, I don't think one could literally compute it, but there might be more one could say to show that it's not an isotropic. Because uh, that, that's the only loophole that kind of appeared, you know, comes to my mind. I mean, there's these other arguments in this most recent uh, swamp land paper and uh, about the question of whether there are uh, dual gauge theories to these constructions. And uh, I, I, I have a I don't conjecture idea of what's wrong with those arguments too, but that's another discussion. Mm -hmm. I think John had the question. Um, so it's very impressive that you can get such a small cosmological constant. It's negative, right? It's negative. <laughs> so why is it relevant to KKLT in that case? This is an example of the um, the supersymmetric step in the KKLT. So in the KKLT construction, what, what, what they do is they first find uh, an n equals one supersymmetric ADS4 vacuum, and then they uplift it. So, right, so the, in terms of an overall modulus, let's say real part of T potential, the first step is to find um, an n equals one ADS4 vacuum. And that's coming from the data that I wrote here, from a flux superpotential and a Kähler, uh, sum of non-perturbative terms for the Kähler moduli. Um, and then what happened in the KKLT paper, right, is they added an anti-brain and found that they found they got a new minimum here. Now, let, let's talk about uh, about De Sitter briefly. There's no reason known to me that it should be impossible to do this second step. However it's going to involve a nightmarish change of technology because the machinery I'm using here is, is consistently exploiting you know, integer data, holomorphic stuff. You have to switch over to PDE land because to really argue that you understand an anti-brain configuration, you have to find a warp throat. We did that. We wrote a paper showing you can find warp throats with the right hierarchies. That's actually settled. Um, and other people, uh, the, the group of Blumenhagen did the same thing and by slightly different means, they agree. But then if you put an anti-brain in it, you have to argue that the back reaction is very well controlled and doesn't disrupt anything else. I just have no confidence um, yet that we, can, that we can demonstrate that. I don't see a reason why it shouldn't work, but that's not the same as saying I can do it. But one doesn't have to try that way, right? You could just try to find uh, supersymmetry breaking effects in the same EFT. And that's what we're trying to do. So that would be like KKLT, but not. It would be getting to some picture that looks like this without ever adding an anti-brain. And now, um, on this question of the positiveness of the CC, in these examples, the CC is, is negative. I don't see any reason whatsoever that would prevent me. I'm not saying I can do it yet, because we haven't yet succeeded. I don't see why we shouldn't be able in 2022 or 2023 to write a paper with 
a very small, maybe not 10 to the minus 120, but a very small positive CC. But with the SUSY breaking scale um, such that the gravitino mass is 10 to the minus 33 electron volts. So on field theory grounds, it's, it's, sort, of, it's sort of silly. It's not solving the real problem. Yes. It's never going to solve the real problem. And, and it's, it's baked into the construction that this kind of vacuum, which is exponentially easier to find. So now I was talking about these two kinds of things, right, where you have um, either you're canceling some perturbative things against each other. That's what I would call sort of a generic solution. If you look really deep, you know, look 10 to the minus... 10 to the plus 123 deep in there, you might find a really small positive CC and large SUSY breaking. And that would, that would be great. Of course, you're going to have to dig very deep. These things are much, the ones I've described, are much easier to find, but they will never succeed in having both large SUSY breaking and exponentially small positive CC. So we, we're not trying that. But I think it would be fun to exhibit a de Sitter vacuum in this context, even if it has an unrealistic value of the CC, just to say, look, it exists. These are its properties. One can go play with it. And once we have one, I would suppose we'll eventually just be able to produce millions at, at a click. Okay, so maybe we have time for one last short question, <laughs> if any. No? Okay, so let's, thanks, Naya. <laughs>